morning. I am Kostas Tsiufis, Professor of Cardiology in the Athens University in Greece. It is my great pleasure, on behalf of my co-chairman, Professor Dagmara Herring from Gdansk, Poland, to welcome you all in this interesting and hopefully interactive session offered by Medronic. We have uh, with us a great uh, faculty, uh, Professor uh, Sanchez uh, from uh, Bucaramanga, Colombia. Welcome, uh, Alex Alejandro. And uh, Professor uh, Patak from Monaco. Welcome, uh, Atul. And uh, we have, uh, we, I hope to have a very good uh, session. Uh, let me just uh, present in, uh, as an introduction three uh, statements to highlight three points. First, the high burden of uncontrolled uh, hypertension worldwide and uh, the huge impact of hypertension on cardiovascular and renal morbidity and mortality. Second uh, point that I would like to highlight is that the Medronic simplicity system disrupts afferent and efferent neural communication between the kidney and the brain uh, using a, a control at target in radiofrequency energy delivery. At multiple, some control trials have demonstrated significant safe and sustained blood pressure reduction in uncontrolled hypertensive patients. And the last point, uh, a couple of months um, earlier, in June, the uh, European Society of Hypertension released the new edition of the European Hypertension Guidelines uh, that, for the first time, provide the recommendation for use of renal innervation uh, for treating uncontrolled hypertensive patients. Having said that, uh, let me uh, go on uh, to start the session. Unfortunately, at the last moment, Professor uh, uh, Roland Schmitter was not able uh, to uh, travel, so I will replace uh, him uh, in his uh, talk. And to present uh, what the new guidelines and expert consensus on renal innervation have proposed. This is my conflict uh, of interest. And um, just to remind you, in 2018, the Joint European Society of Hypertension, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines for the Management of Hypertension, uh, did not provide recommendation for the clinical use for the routine therapy of hypertension for renal innervation uh, until further evidence on um, uh, regarding their efficacy and uh, safety would be available. In the meantime, high quality randomized control trials confirm the blood pressure lowering safety and efficacy of renal denervation um, for um, treating uncontrolled hypertensive patients. So, a number of scientific societies uh, worldwide published consensus statement, position statement, updated guidance for use of renal denervation. Uh, at the European level, uh, we had two important uh, such uh, documents, one uh, from uh, European Society of Hypertension released in 2021, and the second one from the European Association of Percutaneous Cardiovascular Interventions in collaboration with European Council on Hypertension, uh, published a couple of months ago. And as I mentioned previously, in June, European Society of Hypertension uh, released the uh, new hypertension guidelines. These guidelines are endorsed also by two important scientific societies, European Renal Association, International Society of Hypertension. We used in these guidelines the same terminology that was used in the previous joint guidelines with European Society of Cardiology, but also there is an update on the definition of the level of evidence. Uh, this uh, movement was um, mainly influenced by the criteria proposed by the great working group and also by the definitions used by the American Society of, Hypertension, American Society of Cardiology, uh, and American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. We give a, gave a priority uh, to the randomized control trials of meta-analysis of randomized control out, uh, trials with cardiovascular outcome. 
uh, and not so much uh, priority to randomize to control trials with surrogate measures included blood pressure. These guidelines provide a recommendation for renal denervation. According to guidelines, renal denervation can be considered as a treatment option in patients who have uncontrolled blood pressure, despite the use of antihypertensive drug combination therapy, since single pill combination therapy is the recommended at any step of antihypertensive management in the new uh, European hypertension guidelines or if drug treatment elicits serious side effect and poor quality of life. Class of evidence, um, a class of recommendation two, level of evidence B, according to what previously I explained. Why the guidelines provide such recommendations for inland innervation? Because we have um, uh, data from randomized control trials showing significant reduction in blood pressure. Focusing on the simplicity system by the Medronic system, we have data uh, in more than 1,000 patients using the spiral catheter, and we appreciate here in this pool analysis from first in man, off man, on man, and global simplicity rates at six months, a significant reduction of um, office systolic blood pressure by 15 millimeter of mercury and in a 24 hour systolic blood pressure by a 9 millimeter of mercury. And the same is true also in all the spectrum of uncontrolled hypertensive patients, naive of medication or on one, two, three, or patients with resistant hypertension. And also there, are, there is consistency in blood pressure reduction regardless of the technology that was used to disrupt the renal fibers, RF, or ultrasound energy. Apart from the significant, clinically significant uh, office and ambulatory systolic blood pressure reduction, renal denervation demonstrate uh, what we name uh, always on effect on 24 hours blood pressure lowering, independently of the medication and here's. Uh, we, this is very important, taking into account the adverse prognostic role of nocturnal hypertension of non-DP profile and morning uh, shares. And the last but not least, this blood pressure reduction associated to induced by renal denervation sustains for a period, uh, for a long period of time. Now we have data uh, for uh, this uh, durable blood pressure reduction up to 10 years based on the Australian experience, average follow up 8.8 years, and the German experience 9 um, uh, years. We have data from um, HDN um, uh, on medication extended study for three years confirming the durability of blood pressure uh, drop. Apart from this recommendation for uncontrolled hypertension, also guidelines provide a recommendation for renal denervation in patients with resistant hypertension. Accordingly, Renal denervation can be considered as an additional treatment option in patients with resistant hypertension if GFR is over 40, according to the inclusion criteria in the randomized control trials. Class 2, level of evidence B. This is the flow chart proposed by guidelines for the treatment of uh, patients with resistant hypertension. I like so much this because it gives a practical uh, guidance how to manage patients and the guidelines after having proposed, after confirming the diagnosis of uh, resistant hypertension, the physicians could select either to add drugs, spironolactone, central actin, beta, beta blockers, or consider renal denervation if GFR is over um, 40. And this is uh, also very, very important. We have data, solid evidence that renal denervation is a safe uh, procedure. Uh, no concerns are raised regarding the uh, reintervention in the renal arteries, no renal artery stenosis. You see here the incidence uh, of uh, reintervention uh, post renal denervation is only uh, 0.2% per year. Data from meta analysis including 50 trials, and also there is no any signal for significant deterioration in the kidney function. 
in line with the Water Guidelines, uh, European Hypertension Guidelines proposed. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this consensus statement for European cytocardiology also provides similar recommendations. Renal denervation may be used in adult patients with uncontrolled resistant hypertension, and renal denervation may be a possible treatment option for patients unable to tolerate antihypertensive drugs in the long term and for patients who express a preference to undergo renal denervation in a tailored shared decision-making process. The guidelines highlight the importance uh, of shared decision-making process uh, in patients uh, who are willing to undergo renal denervation. According to the guidelines, uh, Professor Pathak may say more uh, later uh, on in the session. And the last but not least, uh, this statement is very, very important that renal denervation should only be performed in experienced specialized center to guarantee appropriate selection of eligible patients and completeness of the denervation procedure. Class 1, level of evidence C. With that, I would like to place a full stop and uh, pass the mic to my co-chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tiufus, for your excellent introduction to radiofrequency ablation. And now we will move to the case-based discussion supporting the treatment with renal denervation as a third pillar for uncontrolled hypertension, as is officially recommended by the 2023 European Hypertension Guidelines. Professor Tiufus will continue with his first case with a patient with difficult to control hypertension. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, I will uh, continue presenting a case of difficult to control hypertension. This is my conflict again. Uh, uh, our case is a male, 56 years old, smoker, obese, with a history of forces, but he is not compliant with CPAP. He has a history also of paroxysmal lateral fibrillation and history of uncontrolled hypertension for five years. Office blood pressure, 161, 100 for diastolic, carefully measured according to the recommendations of guidelines. Heart rate, 77 mpits per minute, and he is on treatment with a triple combination. Olmesartan, amlodipine, uh, theazide, uh, for uh, 45 to 12.0 milligram for a diuretic. Physical examination was unremarkable, and from the, his history, he experienced edema when the physician increased the dose of amlodipine from 5 to 10 milligram. Uh, we confirm uh, the uncontrolled hypertension by performing APPM. We see here the uh, 142, the uh, ambulatory systolic blood pressure. ECG was uh, without any significant pathological uh, finding, as well as in echo revealed mild uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, retinal grade 2, kidney ultrasound was normal, and uh, from his um, lamp test, we see here that uh, GFR was over 60, uh, serum potassium was 4.6, and uh, sodium was 132. Albumin creatinine ratio 19. So, based on our on the guidelines, this patient uh, is a case of resistant hypertension because he is on optimal dose of three drugs. He blood pressure, high blood pressure was confirmed by APPM. We cannot do more about that here because the patient is, is not only one uh, pill. There is no case uh, of uh, secondary hypertension, and also uh, the patients we know that suffer from uh, osses. These patients are not a common. Actually, um, if we see the pool of patients with uncontrolled hypertension, uh, in this uh, pool, some patients suffer from pseudo-resistant hypertension, some patients from secondary hypertension, some patients for true resistant hypertension. For this reason, I like, I prefer the term difficult to control hypertension, which represents a very mixed group of patients with target organ damage and cardiovascular or renal disease 
older patients, diabetes may do CKD and obesity are the most common factors associated with resistant hypertension. And the true prevalence, uh, the prevalence of true apparent uh, treatment resistant hypertension is estimated to be about 5%, and the pathophysiological background is related to the increased sympathetic activity, increased renin uh, angiotensin system activity, and sodium and fluid irritation. But Treated and management of patients with resistant hypertension difficult to control is always a challenging since this condition is associated with adverse outcome. Resistant hypertension, persistent resistant hypertension is associated with threefold increased risk for major cardiovascular events. So, how to manage this patient? For all patients, the guidelines recommend lifestyle changes, uh, uh, treatment of comorbidities, optimization of current uh, therapy. In our case, could we, could we optimize further the therapy? The patients, you see the therapy, and coming to the diuretic, sometimes we can increase the dose of diuretic, we can replace the diuretic, or also we can combine diuretics. But you see the sodium level was 132 with this dose of diuretic. If we increase the dose of diuretic, the risk of um, further decrease in the uh, sodium is um, very clear. Uh, also, there is no so strong evidence in terms of cardiovascular protection to change the thiazide diuretic with uh, uh, thiazide-like diuretic, uh, and also is, they are not uh, available in a, so many triple combinations. So, the guidelines recommend, as previously discussed, uh, to add spironolactone uh, or central reactin or amylorid. We have evidence from pathway two about the beneficial effect of spironolactone, but do not expect miracles. If you see carefully, the superiority of spironolactone over doxazosine bisoprolol was when uh, spironolactone was administered in dose of 50 mg per day, and we know that such dose is not well tolerated. We have data that even if we prescribe spironolactone, the compliance, the adherence in long-term period is very poor, only 30% uh, of those patients. Could we administer central actin? Yes, we have data from the very hot study providing similar uh, blood pressure reduction with spironolactone, but also these drugs are associated with side effect. What about amyloride? Amyloride has also uh, proven its efficacy, but in the market the dose is only 5 mg instead of 10 mg that was used in the trial, and there is no available as a single agent. Any help could we get from the new drugs on the horizon, like the aprosidan? We know the precision study is showing some effect of aprosidan, additional effect, but with significant side effects. And also, uh, the HALO study was negative for Baxostrat. So, coming back to the guidelines, once we cannot, let's say, offer uh, a good solution for the drugs, the guidelines consider uh, recommend to consider renal denervation, and this was the case in our, um, in our patient, uh, according to the guidelines. Uh, we performed um, uh, renal denervation by using the spiral system. This is the orthography confirming that there is no any renal uh, injury uh, in the renal arteries and the elective engagement, and by using the spiral catheter in both the renal arteries, we ablate um, uh, the renal uh, fibers. And three months post renal denervation, the office blood pressure was reduced without changing the medication. The blood pressure in uh, ambulatory blood pressure was significantly reduced by 10 millimeters of mercury. And six months later, office blood pressure was within the accepted uh, uh, levels, 125, uh, 85 for diastolic, without changes in medication. So, dear colleagues, I would say that in 2023, according to guidelines, if we have a patient with resistant hypertension difficult to control, lifestyle changes should be the first step, um, combination therapy the second step, and renal denervation the third step for enjoying uh, decline in blood pressure in order to save more lives. With that, I would like to thank you all for attending my talk.
Thank you, Professor Tupus, for this uh, excellent case presentation. Are there any comments uh, or questions from the audience? Yes, please. Your presentation. And to consider really uh, resistant hypertension, uh, the patient should be in chlortalidone or, or indapamide, not an side. No. This is uh, could be, but it's not necessary because, first of all, there is no any difference between thiazide and uh, chlorothidone and dopamine in terms of uh, blood pressure reduction, although there are some data that they are more potent and for a longer duration of action. But according to, uh, according to guidelines, the new edition, but also the previous edition, Thiazide, thiazide like diuretic are considered a sequel regarding their antihypertensive effect. And don't forget, we don't have data that chlorothalidone or even in the mind could uh, be associated with better cardiovascular outcome. Okay. Thank you. We have maybe time for a short one, two questions, please. Maybe in the end we'll have more, but... Yeah, but there was any experience... Uh, on patients who had an operation for aortic coarctation, often they are young and then they are hypertensive. You have any experience if uh, this, the denervation does work in this kind of patient? Uh, there is no any experience on that. Uh, so I would say at the present, uh, le there is no any indication. Let's focus to treat patients. Uh, according to the guidelines, patients with uncontrolled hypertension, patients with re confirmed resistant hypertension, and after a uh, decision sharing uh, process, to offer this possibility in those who really ha who have data that renal denervation could have. And believe me, we have many, many patients that need renal denervation to improve their uh, blood pressure profile. The final short yeah, question. A very short question. Uh, about this patient is morbidly obese, would you consider gastric bypass or something like this at first before the renal denervation as the obesity is? What, what to consider, sorry? Uh, gastric bypass, I mean... Uh, no, for obesity, no. Thank for the question, giving me the opportunity to say that for hypertension there is no any indication for um, uh, bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery has an indication only for diabetes mellitus, not for hypertension. And also this is not, uh, this level of obesity was, uh, no, let's say, in the upper levels, but not in the levels of malignant uh, uh, obesity. Thank you very much. I have to, one comment to this case. This patient, uh, we know that for resistant hypertension, we need to give the maximum tolerated dose of diuretic or do sequential blockade with diuretic, and we can't do it because of low sodium. And the second point, this patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and obstructive sleep apnea. Additional two comorbidities, which we know have show good uh, results after an denervation. So I think this is um, a suitable patient. We'll now move to the second case, which will be presented by Professor Alejandro San which is Valesquez from Colombia, who will present the case elderly and high cardiovascular risk patient. Thank you, Professor Dekmara, for the presentation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with all of you today in this interesting session. And we're going to review the case number two. It's a high cardiovascular risk patient. And I'm going to show you that this procedure, renal denervation, is feasible and succeeded in these kind of patients. These are my disclosures. So we have a female of 75 years old that has an insulin requiring diabetes and also with, with an ischemic heart disease due to an acute coronary syndrome that was suffering in 2018. The PCI was performed with the DS in the right coronary artery and the left ventricular ejection fraction was normal. Also, we have an unobstructed bilateral or carotid atherosclerosis with a moderate aortic stenosis and a BMI of 26. A thergenic hyperlipidemia was shown in the blood tests with a CKD of 3BA2. She had also a long-term severe uncontrolled isolated systolic hypertension with office blood pressures levels in systolic blood pressure around 170 that, that was confirmed in the ABPM with daytime and nighttime around the same level. 
physical examination was related to the aortic stenosis with an aortic systolic murmur and no pulmonary or peripheral congestion. This is the treatment of our patient. The patient was in five antihypertensive drugs with very good and nice doses as guidelines recommended. And despite these doses and also taking spironolactone, this is the ABPM of our patient. So we can see here that pretty much all the day long, the patient was with a systolic blood pressures above 170. And this is very important because we have to notice that despite five antihypertensive medications that was confirmed the adherence of the patient, she was actually taking all these pills, the blood pressure was on control. The ECG was in sinus rhythm with a first grade AV block and we had to rule out the renovascular hypertension. This is very important because of the age of the patient and also because of the levels of the systolic blood pressure. And we performed a Doppler that showed no stenosis. As I told you before, the blood test showed an atherogenic hyperlipidemia with an uncontrolled uh, diabetes. So what is the risk of our patient? If we use the score two to calculate the risk, we can see that this is a very high risk patient with a rate of 60% of 10 years risk of cardiovascular events. And if we, sh we look at the data that renal deprivation has shown in subgroup of patients with high risk, we can see that this is an effective procedure in this kind of population. And if we try to fit our patient in any of these groups, we could fit it in all of these that I'm pointing out in red. So that's why we decided to perform renal denervation in these patients. So as Dr. Sufi uh, shown before, we start the procedure performing a renal angiogram because we have to rule out any stenosis. We already had the Doppler, but it's mandatory to perform the renal angiogram before. For this, also looking for renal accessory arteries. In this case, we have in the right side a polar artery that was also uh, uh, located, and it's above three millimeters of diameter, so we have to perform the renal denervation also in this artery. And the renal angio also is useful because we have to set the limits. Where are we going to stop? We have to avoid go inside the renal parenchyma because we can harm the renal parenchyma. So if we set these limits, we're going from distal to proximal, performing the ablations and with the safety point. In the left side, we can see the same thing, and this patient also had a renal accessory artery in the left side with a main renal artery that shown no stenosis. Also, we set the limits that we're going to perform to plan in the procedure. And I just want to remind, remind you, this is the shape of the catheter that we're using. The spiral, as its name, got the shape inside the uh, vessel and with the four electrodes that are liberating radio frequency energy at the same time. So this is the catheter inside one of the branches. It's very important when you're performing the procedure to denervate all the branches over three millimeters of diameter and go beyond on the main artery. So we perform the renal denervation from distal to proximal in every branch in the right kidney. And you can see here all the shapes of the catheter that is adapted very well to the curves of the, of the renal arteries. This is the main uh, renal artery. And then we perform also, as I told you, denervation in the renal accessory artery with a final angiogram that shows no stenosis or no residual stenosis and with a very good distal flow. The same, time, the same thing was performed in the, left, in the left side. We can see here the catheter from distal to proximal. It's very important to take your time to denervate all the segments of every branch because this is gonna be related with the success of the procedure. We can see here all the branches denervated and then we went to the main artery from distal to proximal and also we denervate the accessory artery that we have in the left side with a final angiogram that showed no stenosis, a very good distal flow. 
So in total, we had 46 ablations. And it's very important to notice that the number of ablations is proportional to the success of the procedure. So you have to be sure that perform the most of ablations that you can with the anatomy of the patient. This is our ABPM after three months of the procedure. And we can see here a very nice result. The patient normalized the blood pressure with the same medication. We didn't change medication at all. We didn't reduce, but we didn't add medication. And if we compare the post-procedure ABPM with the pre-procedure, we can see an absolute reduction that was significant in these patients. So it was a very nice result. And also we can see that the blood pressure is maintained over 24 hours, and that is related to what Professor Sufis told you before about this always-on effect, that the blood pressure reduction is maintained over 24 hours in every patient. So in the follow-up, 12 months before the renal denovation, the patient maintains in symptomatic with no vascular or renal complications and no visits to ER due to hypertensive crisis. And a very nice result also in the quality of life because the patient referred an improvement in her functional capacity. So my final message will be that appropriate selection of patient is mandatory and you have to know what are the indications for this procedure or what are the real patients that could be benefit of it. Every branch matters. The interventional cardiologist should take the time to denervate every branch and every segment because this is proportional to the success of the procedure. Do not forget the polar arteries. When you're not denervating polar arteries, you're going to go down the rates of success. So this is very important. And finally, as I shown you, in this procedure, renal innovation in a high cardiovascular risk patient is feasible and is successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro, for interesting case. We will move to the third presentation, and then in the end we'll have time for uh, comments and discussion. I will ask to the podium Professor Atul Patak from Monaco, who will present a um, lecture on From Guidelines to Practice Patient Pathways. Thank you, Dagmara. Thank you, Kostas. Yeah, well, I have an easy and difficult task. Difficult because when you talk after interventional cardiologists, you have the feeling that everything is so smooth without any complication, you know, and that uh, we have found the, the final solution for the management of this patient. But from the other perspective of, let's say, a clinician, uh, we are also challenged. I'm going to talk about renal denervation with a patient who is suffering from hypertension. How will I shift from my clinical practice where I'm uh, using a step-by-step -step approach, increasing the number of doses or trying to find the best or the most appropriate drugs to a strategy where I will present and share data about renal denervation or maybe send my patient to a center where the, the procedure is offered. And so, uh, my task is to work on what we call external validity. How do you transfer data from clinical trials to guidelines, finally, to uh, clinical practice? And why I think that we are all convinced about the science and the guidelines, there is a, an elephant in the room, which is the patient. How do you think the patient will perceive this type of information, and what are his perception of the procedure? So, as uh, Professor Tsuf has mentioned, uh, I think that uh, this is probably the starting point for all of us. In the last five to six years, we have gained knowledge and been able to come up uh, with data, trials, and level of evidence which are supporting the therapy and showing that uh, this uh, new approach has a benefit risk ratio which is in favor. And this is, I think, the major argument you will start using when you talk with a patient and you are referring a patient uh, to uh, an interventional cardiologist. What we have also learned is that this therapy can be applied to a quite uh, vast amount of patients if they have been appropriately selected. And you've seen through these two cases that there is a huge workup before sending the patient to renal denervation. 
You need to be sure that the patient is treated correctly. You need sure to be to have evaluated all alternative options. You have excluded secondary hypertension. And so before sending a patient or while you are thinking about the procedure, you need to be sure that all things have been done before. And there is a checklist process, which is, I think, simplifying the approach and ending with what we call the shared decision-making process, where you will share the information with your patient to come up with the best uh, evidence. The publication of these guidelines has been associated with the publication of a huge number of consensus statements coming from different parts of the world. And this table is showing you that finally, if you look at the patient profile, there are a lot of similarities between these documents. And to make uh, the story simple, it will necessarily be a patient with uncontrolled blood pressure, uncontrolled hypertension, but not necessarily a difficult to control resistant hypertensive patient. This was the story of the past, but probably also a patient who is uh, unable to tolerate some type of drugs, who is intolerant to medication, and even, as uh, the last case was presented, a patient with an elevated cardiovascular risk profile. And this I think has also been supported by uh, scientific papers, guidelines, consensus paper, showing that finally what is also an important aspect in the decision process is uh, what we call patient preferences. What are your thoughts? Do you think that when you talk about renal denervation, all patients are ready to go for this type of intervention? Well, probably that these guys think so because they're interventional cardiologists. They never ask a patient his advice about putting a stent or doing a TAVI. But when you do a survey and you challenge the patient and ask them, okay, what are your thoughts? Are you ready to go for, for renal denervation? Well, globally, let's say that the, the rate of answer will be something between 30 to 40%. 30 to 40% of the patient would consider renal denervation if you offer this option uh, in order to control blood pressure. The other thing which is really interesting is that there are no fluctuations according to the level or baseline level of blood pressure. You could be a very severe, high-grade hypertensive patient or just a patient entering into the disease. You see that the level of acceptance is roughly the same in the study presented and published by Roland Schmieder. Second, uh, what we tried to do was using a different type of approach, which is not a survey. A survey is a kind of observational approach where you will ask patient yes or no. What we try to do is come up with a new methodology called DCE for discrete choice experiment. This methodology is basically a methodology where you try to mimic the way the brain process an information. And in fact, when you ask somebody to choose between two phones or two TV, you, you, don't, you, you usually look at not only a single parameter, but at multiple parameters. The size of the screen, the type of the brand, the type of price, if it will fit in your house. And this is what we are trying to mimic when you do DCA. You try to identify attributes, rate of side effects, impact of the therapy on blood pressure, type of patient, and level of attributes, percentage of side effects, the amount of decrease of blood pressure, and you come up with a model. And when you come up with this model, what you see here is that finally what really matters for a patient, what really drives his willingness to go for renal denervation is the ability of the therapy to reduce blood pressure. The higher the blood pressure reduction is, the higher the rate of patients to go for the therapy. And this is so true that it's even able to somehow neutralize all other concerns of the patient. If the therapy is able to reduce blood pressure, the patient is ready to go for the, for the intervention. And this was, I think, very interesting. Uh, blood pressure was finally the strongest predictor or the factor which was influencing at the strongest the treatment choice, whatever the level of reduction, more importantly than, for example, the duration of the effect or uh, probably the risk of side effects. Finally, what we did is we decided to expand this approach and trying to apply this approach in three types of patients using data from trials you are familiar with. We use the data of the so-called OFMED trial to see what will be the rate of response in patients who are untreated. And you see here that the rate of acceptance was close to 20% in those of these patients 
who are offered the treatment when they are not treated with drugs. We use the data of the ODMED trial, which is mimicking a situation where hypertensive patients are treated with one to three drugs, and the ratio of number of patients who are willing to accept the therapy increase in this scenario to 23%. And finally, looking at patients who are probably more severe, but also looking like real-life uh, uh, real patients, you see that uh, using the data of a registry, uh, the percentage of patients who are ready to go for renal denervation increase to 40%. So what is the message here? The message is that what matters for a patient is necessarily to share with him the maximum number of information guided by trials and guidelines, probably share with him the impact of the therapy on blood pressure, and assess with him the benefit-risk ratio. This is my conclusion slide, which is basically summarizing the patient profiles who could benefit from renal denervation beyond cases, guidelines, and scientific evidence where you would take into account patient voice and physician preferences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Atul, for uh, your presentation. Are there any comments from the, the audience? We have time for maybe one short comment. Yes, please. Uh, does renal denervation has, uh, have any effect on the tendency to become hyponatremic in, uh, in patients taking diuretics? Based on the available data from the clinical trials, the answer is clear, no. We have not seen any change, significant change in the level of sodium or potassium levels. So, practically speaking, no. And a short question, yes, please. Hi, I'm a cardiologist, Rene, from the UK. Just asking um, how teachable is the procedure is um, in comparison to other cardiovascular procedures, like coronary angiography, for example. Alexandro, would you like to? Yes. Uh, actually, for interventional cardiologists that are used to perform a coronary PCI, so this is a very easy procedure, okay? But you have to take time and you have to change your mind that you're not going to see the results immediately as we are used when we're performing PCI, you know? You have to wait until three or six months to get the results. But if you perform the procedure in the step-by-step -step that you should, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be successful. And in terms of the, curve, the learning curve that you're going to get, it's very fast. So this is a very simple and very easy procedure for an interventional cardiologist. If I could, uh, one word, I would say that the most critical point is to build a multidisciplinary team. First, hypertension specialist for up selection appropriated patients with all this uh, the workup, and then specialized center. I think that uh, although I agree, Alexandro, it's an easy procedure, despite that, each device has to follow the algorithm, the therapeutic algorithm that has been proved as effective and safe in the guidelines. It's not just to have a catheter and a blade, whatever uh, uh, you have in mind. I know we are a little bit short of time. Maybe the final uh, question from my colleague who I used to work in Australia. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a physician from China, and we all know we don't have the end point for the renal innovation. Um, but um, do you think now our uh, ch challenge is uh, the more the better to ablation? Regarding the uh, clinical outcomes, you you're just speaking, oh, Mace? Okay. We don't have uh, end point for the renal denovation, but uh, do you think uh, the abrasion, the more the better for, the, uh, for we treat the hypertension? This yes, of course. You have to perform the most ablations that you can with in the, the vessels of three millimeters of diameter and more. And if you have a, a renal artery, access, accessory artery, you also have to perform the renal denervation there. So the most ablations that you have, the most is the result that you're going to get and probably the drop in the blood pressure. So yes. 
So uh, how many ablations do you think for the patient? About uh, 50 or 40 ablations? It depends on every patient, because if you have small arteries, maybe you're going to get little ablations. If you have big arteries or polar arteries, as the case that I showed you before, so you're going to get more ablations. The most important thing is that you, can, you have to be sure that all the segments in all the arteries outside the renal parenchyma, about three millimeters of diameter, be denervated. So Thank do you think uh, the effect of the renal denervation uh, depends on the patient's anatomy of his or her uh, renal artery. Yes, it's individual. you have to individualize every patient, you know? You, so every pr procedure is different between patients. Thank you very uh, much. I would like to close this session because a little bit we have time, but I would like to point that uh, now we officially have the one of the devices based therapies for hypertension treatment, and we need to remember that pathophysiologic hypertension is multifactorial, and the currently recommended drugs do not target all regulatory pathways, and we have a scan mechanisms. So in addition to lifestyle modification and antihypertensive treatment, we have the option to treat our patient with renal denervation, but the major is that we need to be um, evaluated and perform with experience centers where is the structure pathway for patient evaluation. I would like to thank all the speakers and the audience and those who attend our session online. Thank you.